Baruch Hashem Yahweh. Hallelujah. Let's turn to the Besorah, the epistle of Yochanan Aleph. We are in 1 John, the final chapter, chapter 5. Chapter 5 of Yochanan Aleph. Let's dig right in with chapter 5 and verse 1. Everyone who believes that Yahusha is Moshiach is begotten of Yahuwah. And everyone that loves him who begot, loves him also who has begotten him. You see, this is about true belief. True belief, it's, it's not learned. Our true belief, our orthodoxy, it's not learned, but it's born out of conversion. It's born out of conversion. That's what it is. Verse 2, by this we know that we love the Benai Yahuwah. How do we know that we love the children of Yahuwah? When we love Yahuwah and we guard his mitzvot, we guard his commandments. For this is the love of Yahuwah, that we guard his commandments, and his commandments, they're not supposed to be heavy. They're not supposed to be burdensome. This passage right here, I know for me personally, and for many of you, this passage I wrestled with when I was in the institutionalized church. This is what drew me to his commandments. I wasn't looking at rabbinic Judaism. I was, I was looking at the Bible. I was looking at the New Testament, and I said, I have a heart for his commandments. I wasn't trying to sacrifice animals. I wasn't trying to do any. I just had a heart for his commandments because his Ruach HaKodesh is in me. And this passage convicted me. I want to guard his mitzvot. Because his mitzvot, they're not supposed to be heavy and they're not hard. You see, your wrestling, my wrestling with Yahuwah and his Torah has been a struggle, has it not? For us to get where we're at today, we didn't get here lightly. All of us have got here through sweat, blood, and tears. We have had to wrestle with his word, endless nights of not sleeping because of fear. I don't want to get this wrong. I don't want to get this wrong. I was convicted based upon this text and others in the New Testament that there was more, that I had a heart to keep his commandments. And I got to tell you, I was so shocked and disappointed at the response from my pastor, from the elders that I serve with, with the youth pastor. I had these men around my house. I was so disappointed with the response because they didn't even understand when I started to talk to them about the Torah and keeping the commandments and Sabbath. They didn't even understand the Hebraic polemic. They didn't even understand the messianic perspective. Yet they discounted it just offhand. And they started to call me names. Well, Matthew, he's a Judaizer. He's a Pharisee. He's fallen from grace. And they just brushed me aside. And many of you just brushed aside. Like you didn't wrestle night and day with his word to come to the understanding that you came. Because you spent all this time checking his word, searching out his word, studying to show you were approved. And then pastors and elders would dismiss what you were saying without even fully understanding what you were communicating. I was disappointed. I thought that they were learned, studied men, that they would study But they just dismiss the narrative without even understanding the narrative. And Proverbs 18 verse 13 tells you, don't speak on a matter before it's fully heard. Because if you do, you show yourself to be foolish. I lost a lot of respect for those individuals because they didn't understand the Messianic, the Hebraic polemic. And they didn't care to. 
And they went to the New Testament and even the Old Testament and ripped verses right out of context. You know those sheep verses? To try and prove the status quo. And I left going, my goodness, they literally don't want to understand. They, they don't want to know. And they dismiss me as a Judaizer, and many of you as Pharisees. Oh, you've gone back to the law. You're fallen from grace. How many of you have heard that? Oh, they're trying to keep the Sabbath. Oh, they're under a curse. They've gone back to the law. All because they wanted to keep their religious construct. And you were threatening that very religious construct. I've got to tell you, I never... I never thought that I would encounter that again. But today, I find myself, and I'm very disappointed and sad to say, I find myself in the same position with leaders, teachers in the Messianic community. They don't understand the book of the law, book of the covenant polemic. They dismiss it, speak on it, Without fully of understanding, they admit they don't understand, yet they talk on something that they don't understand and then rip verses, sheep verses, Torah sheep verses, out of context to try and prove a status quo. And I'm like, oh, this is the same spirit that I dealt with in the church. They don't understand the polemic that I'm trying to communicate and they don't want to because it threatens the status quo and their religious construct. But all of us that have struggled to get where we've got, we are not going to be confined by religious construct. And you can see the weakness You can see the weakness because they don't even understand what you're trying to communicate. And they admit it. And then guess what? You're called names. You're lawless. They're lawless. You're blasphemers. And I'm like, I look at the scripture and I say, well, Abraham, he kept my commandments and my Torah. We're following the faith of Abraham, the book of the covenant living. Genesis 26, verse 25. How about Yahweh when he spoke to Moshe before they went to the mountain and he said, how long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my Torah? Because the Torah is part of the covenant. Exodus 16, verse 28. And then in Exodus 18, verse 20. Teach Israel my Torah. This is before the blood ratification of the book of the covenant. Were these men lawless? Because they kept the Sabbath, the feasts in Exodus 23. But you know what? It's so easy just to dismiss you as lawless. I get dismissed as anti-Semitic. But I'm teaching you that Ashkenaz is a son of Goma. He's not even a Shemite. So how can you classify that as anti-Shemitic? It's foolishness. I'm also just dismissed as a Nazi sympathizer. But you don't know me. My father fought the Nazis. You don't know the conversations that I've heard, what my eyes have seen and my ears have heard. My father was shot by the Nazis. My father liberated the camps that were full of Bolshevik Jews dying of cholera and typhus. He saw what was going on there. He saw what was going on there. But it's so easy to dismiss me because historical truth tramples all upon your sacred history that you learn in your public schools and watched on Hollywood movies. 
You see, because what we're doing with this Malkit Zedek, Book of the Covenant, Book of the Law, dichotomy, is challenging religious construct. And religious men will dismiss you, label you, without even understanding where you're coming from. It's no different than it was in the church. You challenge religious construct. And the true believers that are converted of Yahuwah will continually struggle. And will continually struggle to understand the word. And we will not be dismissed because we challenge a religious construct. And the true converts, the true believers will not be brushed aside. Because that is our challenge. And that is our struggle that makes us Israel. The Israel of Elohim. Correct? It's amazing. It's amazing. You see, belief without love is what? It's the kind of belief that a demon has. Did demons believe in Yahusha? Sure. But they did not have love. You see, guarding his commandments are the natural outworking of our faith. Verse 2. It's the natural fruit that we would produce because we are converted. Verse 2 is the heart of what drew me and most of you to Torah, isn't it? We wanted to search out his commandments. I wasn't interested in Jewish ritual garb. I wasn't interested in animal sacrifices. I just wanted to search out his commandments. And the purity of that is covenant fidelity because I lived an unfaithful life and you all lived unfaithful lives and we understand the heart of keeping commandments is covenant fidelity. It's not dressing up like a Jew. It's not trying to be something that you're not. It is authenticity and it is an inward change. And that is threatening. It is threatening to religious construct because you are a powerful force to be reckoned with when the power is put upon the people and it is taken away from the religious hierarchy. And that is the problem that you are seeing. The empowerment of Yahweh's people in a broken religious world, whether it's Christian institutionalized church, Messianic Judaism, Because they define Torah from a Judaism perspective of five books of the Bible and it is the blind leading the blind until they fall into a satanic ditch. Because they interpret Torah through five books of the Bible because Judaism has for 2,000 years. Yet Abraham was in Yahuwah's Torah. Abraham, before Moses, there was Yahuwah's Torah. Where's your five books? Where's your five books with Abraham? You see, it changes everything. The very institution of Judaism is built upon adherence to commandments, yes. But it's just that those commandments are the volumes of Talmud, the traditions of men, not built upon Yahweh's commandments. It's also the converse for Christianity where the institution disregards the commandments and its very construct is built upon lawlessness, syncretism, and paganism. Both constructs diminish the work of Yahuwah and the commandments into something other than they're not. That's what they do. That's what they do. Verse 4, For whoever is born of Yahuwah overcomes the Olam Hazer. You are overcoming the world. I am overcoming the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the Olam Hazer, this world. Our Emunah, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the Olam Hazer, this world? But he that believes that Yahusha is the son of Yahuwah. You see, genuine faith, it births struggle. Get used to it. That's your life. Genuine faith, it births struggle. Struggle to overcome the flesh. Struggle to overcome sin. Just as Jacob, Yaakov's faith, birthed struggle to overcome the flesh. And then he was Israel. The children of Israel. Our faith birthed struggle, which identifies our very people, Israel. 
the children of Eloah. We overcome the world. We have to overcome the world, don't we? We have to persist in our faith despite the propaganda. And our audience, the secessionists, they were coming in against our audience. And our audience had to overcome the propaganda of the secessionists. The propaganda of the secessionists in the epistles of 1 John was what? Yahushua was just a phantom. That was their propaganda. And Yochanan is writing to the community, overcome the propaganda that Yahushua was a ghost. It's propaganda. It's not true. It's propaganda. It's infiltrated your midst. I'm writing you this epistle to tell you to overcome the propaganda of the secessionists. And today, it's no different for this last end days movement. You need to overcome the Jewish Ashkenazi synagogue of Satan propaganda so that you can cling to the covenant faith of what Torah really is in Yahushua. It's not divorced from Yahushua. It's not divorced from his priesthood and it's not divorced from the Torah of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. You're not lawless. You're just not going to go into a Judaic interpretation of what Torah is. You stand up and you study to show yourself approved. And when they dismiss you and label you, then know that if they did that to him, they're going to do that to you. And if they did that to you in the institutionalized church, well, guess what? They're going to do it to you now because the road is narrow and you are on the path that leads to life. Man. Powerful. I get encouraged as I'm dismissed and labeled. I get encouraged. I get encouraged and I lose respect for those that are doing it because I'm like, if you were authentic, you would study to show yourself approved. You admit, you embarrassingly admit you don't understand, yet you spout. Any man that is worth his salt would go home on his knees and study until he did understand and then maybe you'd have an audience that would respect you. My goodness. It's embarrassing. It truly is. And they expose themselves. We cannot remain party to this world. We have to Stand up to the world. Because if we don't, we will be overcome by this world. And in Yochanan's day, the world was epitomized by the secessionists. And today, the world is epitomized by the synagogue of Satan. They've infiltrated the banks. They've infiltrated Hollywood. They've infiltrated the media. They are globalists, and they are in cahoots with the Zionists. And it is infiltrated the very midst of the faith. We're exposing it, and guess what? It's ugly. And it raises its ugly head. But you stay on course. You keep the faith because Yahweh is drawing his people into the Malkitzedic covenant Torah because it is the end time call of his remnant people that are converted. We're not religious constructs. We are converted to the true faith that was once delivered to the Kedoshim, the saints. Look at verse 6. This is he that came by Mayim, and Dam. Now we're going to focus on this because this is so important. This is he that came by water and blood. Even Yahusha Hamashiach. Not by water only, but by water and blood. In the Greek, the Haidatos ke Haimatos. Or in the Hebrew, by Maim, but by Maim and Dam blood. This text, we're going to spend a little bit of time because it is so important. This text indicates two things. What was not in dispute, Yahushua came by water. That was not in dispute. And what was in dispute, Yahushua came by water and blood. So this text indicates two things. What was in dispute and what was not in dispute. What was not in dispute, they all agreed upon, was that Yahushua came by water. But what the secessionists did not 
agree with that Yahusha came by water and blood. This text indicates that clearly. Now let's dig in. Because there are some variant readings. Some manuscripts read by water and spirit. Some other manuscripts read by water and blood and spirit. Some manuscripts read by water and spirit and blood, but all of those are very poorly attested to. Does any, of, does any of your texts, are they a little different than by water and blood? You don't have any of those variant readings. Good. That means we've got some good translations in front of us. Not by water only, but by water and, and blood is certainly the original. So hopefully that's what you have in your text. Now... Let's break this down. What does not by water only, but by water and blood mean to communicate to us? What is he trying to communicate to us? By water, in the Greek, is en chaidati. En chaidati, by water. Now, in the fourth gospel, in the gospel of John, en chaidati, listen. En Haidati is used three times, and each, I, I just, this is just amazing. As we dig more, brother, over the years, we dig more and we get reconfirmation of the message. En Haidati in the Gospel of John is used three times, and in each and every instance of its usage, it's used to refer to the ministry of priesthood transfer performed by John the Immerser upon Yahusha. John 1.26, John 1.31, and John 1.33. En Haidati distinguishes and clarifies that they believed in the priestly transfer by water. The secessionists didn't even take issue with that. They all agreed on the priestly transfer of John the Immerser to Yahusha as the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. They all agreed on that. Even the secessionists agreed upon that. But now let's go further. Because en chaidati is linguistically connected to the transfer of priesthood performed by the legitimate Aaronic high priest, John the Immerser, upon the one who went into the water. He went into the water as a king. Matthew chapter 2 clearly demonstrates that Yahushua was a melech. He was the melech. Yet he came out of the water not just a Melech, he came out of the water, Melech Zadik, thus fulfilling all righteousness, Matthew 3.15. Allow this to be so now, for this will allow us to fulfill all Zadakah, En Haidati, En Haidati. The En Haidati by water allowed John the Immerser to fulfill the priestly transfer. Even the secessionists believed in that. So, your and my struggle today is a greater struggle as the end time remnant than the secessionists. There is a greater evil that has infiltrated the ranks of believers than even the evil of the secessionists. And we're calling it out. They who say they are Jews but are not, but are the synagogue of Satan that have infiltrated the messianic movement because they're not truly converted. The fruit that they produce leads you to deny Yahushua, embrace Karaitism, and go right over into the Talmud, the Mishnah, and the temple of man construct. You need to be loose from those chains. The secessionists, they did not even dispute this priestly transfer. But today, the majority of the Levitical hierarchy within the Messianic movement, they do. That is extremely troubling in the light of Scripture. Do you see how much more of a perilous situation that this puts us in? 
more perilous an age than the age of the secessionists in the first century? The Enchidati language identifies further the in Bereshit clause of 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. Because what was in the beginning? It was the inception point here on earth of his high priestly transfer that happened in the beginning of his ministry. Don't forget what happened in Bereshit, the beginning of the priestly transfer. And number two, therefore, in the Greek, kai haimatos, by blood, by blood. Now, this language identifies his sacrificial death and his heavenly transference into the right hand Position. Now, the session, secessionists, they did dispute this second point. This is what they did dispute. The secessionists accepted the first water, en chaidati, and his priestly transference from Levit Levitical by John the Immerser, by water, into the Malkitzedic. They accepted that. But they didn't believe in his final sacrificial hilasmos in the Greek, his keporah in the Hebrew, or his atonement as it comes across in the English. Why? Because they were docetics. They believed in phantoms. They believed in phantoms. You see, our battle, it isn't with the secessionists. Our battle is with the synagogue of Satan that rejects both one and two. They reject both one and two. On the surface, the secessionists, they appear to be doctrinally on point on the surface until you peel back the veneer. And then when you peel back the veneer, you'd start to expose the cracks. Today, the synagogue of Satan... Oh, they may seem to be on point on the surface, but when you peel back the veneer, ask them to document their Jewish genealogy. You can hear a pin drop. Nothing. Nothing. Ask them to clarify their interpretation of Torah. Is there a book of the covenant and a book of the law division? Ask them to clarify either his historical or millennial view of the book of Ezekiel. Ask them to clarify the role of Yahusha's blood and whether it's at variance with future animal sacrifices. Ask that question. Ask them to clarify the role of the temple and the priesthood today. Is it you or is it a block of stone and an Ashkenazi? And you will find, my friends, the horrific truth. Our community of sincere believers that sought the mitzvot of chapter 5, verse 1, our heart was to seek that which was easy and light, his commandments, his Torah, the Torah of Abraham, and we find that we have been infiltrated by a more heinous tribe than the secessionists. That's the reality that you and I are living in, and I sound the alarm, and I sound the alarm, and I sound the alarm. And guess what? People, they hear it. They hear the alarm. Yahweh ordained Yochanan's epistle not only for 2,000 years ago, but for today to his last day's priesthood people to arm us against the wiles of the devil, the synagogue of Satan. Verse 7, and it is the very Ruach that bears witness of this. And it is the very Ruach that bears witness of this. Because the Ruach is a met. The Spirit is truth. The Ruach and the Maim, the water and the Dam, the blood, and these agree as echad. Now, this is a greatly misunderstand, misunderstood verse, and you get all kinds of doctrines built upon it. But the three are one, not in essence, but in edah, the Hebrew word for witness. 
the three are one, not in essence, but in witness. The Hebrew word for witness, ayin, dalet, chay, edar. Now, I'm going to go on and address that because, you see, the synagogue of Satan will rip out verses out of context and say that we have no two or three witnesses if we're holding to the book of the law, book of the covenant division. Am I right? But to say that there is no two or three witness testimony for book of the covenant Zedeks by taking Deuteronomy 17.6 and 19.5 out of context is disingenuous at best. But it's willfully misleading. In light of this very first, 1 John 5, 7, we have the commandments of the New Testament that we are to adhere to that tell us the testimony of witness. The Torah of first mention of witness is Bereshit, Genesis chapter 21, verse 30, embedded within the covenant living. Within the covenant living, book of the covenant, Malkitzedic living, Edar, witness, is mentioned, I think, like nine times. It comes from the Torah of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And its first reference of having witnesses is when seven, which we know means perfection, seven ewe lambs were given as a witness to the well of water. Genesis 21, verse 30. What does that mean? The perfect lamb is the witness of the living water. So don't rip a text out of context because you'll trip all over yourself. And that's what happens. We have the testimony of the Torah of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that was good enough for Yahusha. That was good enough for Rav Shaliak Shaul. It's good enough for us because it was good for Yahweh to give his covenants of promise to the patriarchs. We have three witnesses, the spirit, the water, and the blood. There is no greater testimony than that. We have three witnesses. All three are intricately connected to the priesthood, the water and the Ruach at the Jordan, the blood at the tree, and all three are in perfect agreement. You see, people don't realize this. They're actually witnessing against the Ruach HaKodesh. His mikvah, his immersion, and his sacrifice when they try to kick his feet off of his footstool. How do they do that? When you decide that you're going to enthrone another high priest here on earth, you are kicking Yahusha's feet off of his footstool. And if you're comfortable with that, then please stay far away from me because I'm not comfortable with kicking my Savior's feet off of his footstool. And if you want to put in an Ashkenazi high priest, you are kicking Yahusha's feet off his very footstool. And he deserves the rest because he died for your and my sins. Right? It's a finished work. Verse 9. Actually, I'm jumping ahead. I'm passionate today. Can you tell? Man. My goodness. Let's look at the longer verse, the infamous longer verse. Of course, we know, of course, we know this from our church days, the, the Johannine comma, right? The Johannine comma. Chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. The Latin, that is, for comma, meaning a sentence or a clause. Now, this, of course, is the longer variant reading, which is not attested to by any um, ancient manuscripts. But this is how it would read. It's commonly called the Johannine comma. For there are three that testify in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And there are three that testify on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three are one, and you now have a whole doctrine of the Trinity built upon the Johannine comma, right? But the Johannine comma 
is preserved in only a few very late Greek manuscripts from the 10th to the 18th century. And it found its way there through the Latin manuscripts of the 9th century. In fact, it appears in no early Greek manuscripts and no old Latin versions before the 7th century. So it's correctly omitted from most translations today. If it's in your translation, suggest you get a new translation. Now we can go to verse 9. If we receive the witness of men, where is the witness of men coming from? Yerushalayim. If you receive the witness of men, the witness of Yahuwah comes from the Shamayim, the heavens. It's much greater, is it not? Which witness are you going to go with? Which is your Edah? The witness of men from Jerusalem? Or your witness from Yahweh, which is from the Shamayim, which is greater? For this is the witness of Yahweh that he has testified concerning his son. Verse 10. He that believes on the son of Yahweh has the witness in himself. He that believes not Yahweh has made him a liar. Because he believes not the witness that Yahweh gave of his son. You see, the verb to witness is martyrio. Martyrio, where we get martyr. This is sobering. Because will some be martyred because of their faith in the Malkitzedic high priest at the hands of the Temple Institute? at the hands of the synagogue of Satan. It's a very sobering thought. Revelation 5.9 appears to answer that with a resounding yes. With a resounding yes. And we see the threats coming in. And it is troubling. Do you know the heinous rituals that are performed under the altar? Revelation 5. Do you know the heinous rituals that are performed under the altar? Have you gone under the tunnels underneath the Anatonia Fortress in Jerusalem? I've gone underneath those tunnels and I've seen the orthodox heinous rituals that happen right under those tunnels in Jerusalem. And you don't think that they'll disappear, believers in Yahushua? down there and do ritual on you underneath in those tunnels. They're davening because they're copulating with Babylonian deities in their davening rituals. I've seen them. Right there, we've seen it. Very disturbing. Very disturbing. You don't think that they'll just disappear some believer in Yahushua down there when you stand up for Yahushua as your high priest? Underneath the altar, Revelation 5, 9. Look at verse 11 of our text. And this is the witness that Yahuwah has given us eternal Chaim, life. And this Chaim, life, it's in his son. He that has the son has Chaim, life. And he that has not the son of Yahuwah has not life. You see, the witness motive is found in contexts where Yahuwah incarnate in Yahushua has a controversy with the world. And that controversy with the world is incarnate with the Jews. So should we expect anything different? We're having a controversy with the synagogue of Satan the world incarnate in the false Jews, right? You can see the parallelisms. Verse 13. Verse 13 of chapter 5. These things I have written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of Yahuwah, that you may know that you have eternal Chaim, life, and that you may believe on the name of Yahuwah, on the name of the Son of Yahuwah. Verse 14, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he will hear us. And if we know that he hears us, 
Whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire from Him. You see, prayer isn't about communicating with Yahweh to acquire petitions or to somehow force His hand. That's not what our prayers are supposed to be like. But it's about communing with Yahweh in intimacy because He hears. He hears you. And that, that's enough. That he just hears, that he just hears, that's enough for me. That's enough that the creator of the world, through the mediation of his son, that he just hears my prayers to commune with him, that's enough. That's magnificent. He has a listening ear for you. He has a listening ear for you. It's more than many of these teachers. They don't even have a listening. They don't even want to hear you. <laughs> right? Thank goodness he has a listening ear for you. You are considered. He considers you. He acts upon what you speak. Especially when you speak that forth which will maximize the coming of his kingdom and the fulfillment of his will. The coming of his kingdom is a Malkitzedic kingdom, thus fulfilling all righteousness. Because he's coming back as a king of righteousness. That's the kingdom that you and I need to be fulfilling. And that's how we get our prayers heard. Verse 16 gives us the basis for the medieval distinction between venial and mortal sin. Right? Those medieval. Man, that would have been a crazy time to live, wouldn't it? Oh, my goodness. But that's hardly Yochanan's concern here, is it? Right? He's not trying to communicate anything about venial and mortal sins. The Catholicos, I don't know, they just came up with that. But he is genuinely concerned about apostasy within the community. If a person begins to close their heart off against the influence of the Ruach HaKodesh, then what do you have? You have a lot of trouble coming that way. Because some people, they close their heart off against the Ruach HaKodesh so obstinately and persistently that repentance becomes, it becomes a moral impossibility. Do you realize that? If you close your heart off against the Ruach HaKodesh so obstinately that repentance then becomes a moral impossibility. And you go, well, how can that be so? It's no different than a human body that has been starved. It starved itself so much to such a great extent as to make digestion or even reception of food impossible. You try to eat, and what? When my father went to the camps where the Bolshevik Jews were, dying of typhus and cholera, and they started to bring food into the camps, what happened? It killed many of them because they hadn't had food for three months because of the Allied bombing campaigns throughout Germany that destroyed the food lines and the water and brought forth dreadful disease that people wasted away from cholera and typhus. Eyewitness testimony communicated to me. You don't know me but you'll judge me based upon Hollywood movies and Steven Spielberg and what you learn in a public school educational system. That is embarrassing. You show yourself right there, sacred history, because it tugged on your heartstrings with Schindler's List. Schindler's List was a fictional piece. And people believe that it was actually based upon fact. It's a Fictional piece. Fiction. But my, oh, you see Schindler's List. Oh, my God. Oh, oh, that was real stuff there. It's based upon a fictional book. Really? Oh, but you don't want to bring that up, right? Wrong. 
You see, just like the body that has been starved, that it can't even digest food when it's offered, so the soul that refuses offers of grace until the very power to receive grace, it perishes. So a condition sin unto death ensues. Sin unto death ensues. Blaspheming of the historical acts of Yahushua, including his miracles by calling them works of the devil, is a sin leading unto death. And that is what Judaism is built upon. Blasphemy. Blasphemy. Let's tell the truth. Stop emulating spiritual death. If you're a believer in Yahushua, why would you want to try and outdo the Jews when they are built? The religion is built upon spiritual death. They blasphemed and they said that Yahushua's power came from a devil. The whole religion is built upon blasphemy and you're trying to emulate it. And I'm the crazy one. Wow. You see, shine the light and all the little cockroaches they start to scatter. Oh my goodness, he did a Spanish accent. Right? Oh my goodness. Email bomb. That's so racist. Jimmy Cricket. Verse 16. If any man sees his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him chayim for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. And I do not say that he shall make tefillah for it. Those who commit it. Listen to that. I do not say that he shall make prayer for those who commit it. That, in many translations, you'll see that. And how it's worded is very intriguing. Because in many translations, it's feminine singular, and it can only refer to the sin, feminine singular, unto death of the previous clause. What does it mean? You see, Yahweh told Yirmiyahu, he told Jeremiah, stop praying for your fellow countrymen. Stop it. Stop praying for them. Jeremiah 7, 16, 11, 14, and 14, 11. At what point are we just going to stand up and affirm the righteousness of Yahweh? At what point are you just going to stand up and affirm the righteousness of Yahweh? Because Yahweh's judgment is important. Stop allying yourself with the cause of others. Stop allying yourself with the cause of others. There comes a time, and this is hard, and it's not taught, but there comes a time when intercession, it just has to cease. Stop praying for them. Cease praying for them for the sake of the person who intercedes, you. This is very sobering. We shouldn't pray where Yahweh's will stands against us. As prayer warriors, our loyalty must remain with Yahweh. It doesn't remain with the transgressor. And that's where so many of you are in turmoil and conflict. Because your loyalty is still with the transgressor. Your loyalty needs to be with Yahuwah. And there comes a time where you cease intercessory work for those that are given over to transgression and wickedness. For your sake. For your sake. That's what this verse is teaching. We pray. Yes, we pray. But we're free to cease our prayers When the time has arrived, you have to recognize when that time has arrived and that takes discernment. Even Yahushua, even Yahushua limited who he was willing to pray for. 
Oh, well, Jesus just loved the world. He prayed forever. No, he didn't. He limited who he was willing to pray for and who he was willing not to pray for. He only prayed for those the Father had given him. He didn't pray for the world, John 17, verse 9. He didn't. Look at verse 17. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin that is not unto death. We know that whoever is born of Yahuwah sins not. But he that is begotten of Yahuwah guards himself, and the wicked one touches him not. All pardon for sins ultimately comes from Yahusha's finished work and his mediation on the tree. Let's be very clear from that from the outset. But there is a procedure for confession and repentance, and it is to be used for forgiveness of sins, not unto death, in the Malkitzedic priesthood by his Kohanim. You see, shortly before his ascension, Yahushua said this to his disciples, and this is for you. Whoever sins, ye forgive. They are forgiven unto them. Whoever soever sins ye retain, they are retained. John 20, verse 23. You see, Yahushua was actually granting to the Talmudim, his disciples, the authority to forgive sins. And that the disciples passed this on to their successors, the Malkitzedic priesthood today. The same license to pardon sin, not unto death. Now, granted, John Calvin's interpretation of John 20, verse 19 through 23 is diametrically opposed to this view. I grant you that. But look at Matthew 9, verse 5. The Son of, ha- the son of Man, Matthew 9, verse 5. The Son of Man, listen, has authority on earth to forgive sins. The Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Now, I'm going to take a side tack here because this is important. I want to deal with the hermeneutics of dealing with the sheep verse that Hebrews 8.5 is always brought up. Now, let's deal with some consistent hermeneutics now, right? Because if you want to interpret Hebrews 8, 5, for if he were on earth, well, there can't be a Malkitzedic priesthood and Yahushua can't be high priest because he's not on earth. Well, then your sins aren't forgiven either because guess what? He ain't on earth anymore either. And it says that he only has authority on earth. Can we go back to kindergarten school or should we leave kindergarten school? These arguments are ridiculous. Sheep versus to try and entrap sheep, but it's the goats that go to the sheep versus, you see? Consistency with your hermeneutics would tell you that Hebrews 8.5 doesn't mean that based upon what we just read right there. Because my sins are forgiven and Yahushua isn't on earth. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. So don't try and rip Hebrews 8.5 out to justify a Levitical priesthood. It just doesn't work for those that will study to show ourselves approved. You're not dealing with babies in the church anymore. Right? It's his people. What was that? What are you laughing at? What? No more milk. Right, yes, sorry. I've got the girls up front here with their snacks and beverages cracking up. Crying, would you want some popcorn? I mean, these girls, they really would like that. They sit here and they're like, oh, these girls are totally like, I know what you're like. Sit back, they go, oh, the the littles aren't here. Let's relax. We've got a beverage. (laughs) All right, my goodness. But look what it says in Corinthia Olive, 1 Corinthians 3. Paul says, I have already judged him that hath done so. In and in also we find in 2 Corinthians 2.10, Shaul justifies his forgiveness of the repentant man, and he says thus, Indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, I have done for your sakes. 
in the person of Mashiach. Paul, forgiving people. Shaul, forgiving people. And what do we find? Second Corinthia, Corinthia Bet 5.18. Shaul says this, All this is from Elohim, who through Mashiach reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry. You have a ministry of reconciliation. 2 Corinthians, Corinthians Bet 5.20, Shaul confirms, so you, we are ambassadors of Mashiach. We are ambassadors. We have the ambassador anointing, which is the Malkitzedic priesthood. Matthew 18, verse 18, the apostles are given authority to bind and to loose. The authority to bind and loose includes administrating and removing the temporal penalties due to sin, not unto death. That's a powerful priesthood anointing. You see, even the Jews, the Ashkenazis, they even understood this since the times of the leper. Why? Because what would the leper do? The leper would go to the priest and receive forgiveness for sins, not unto death. Leviticus, Vaikra 14, Vaikra 5, verse 4, Vaikra 19, verse 21. Even under the book of the law system, Yahweh used priests to forgive and cover the sins of others, not unto death. If he used that under the book of the law, you don't think he's going to use something greater than that under the authority of his son and his ordained priesthood people? Timothy Olive, chapter 2, verse 5, makes it clear that Yahushua is the only mediator, but he was free to decide how his mediation would be applied to you and I today, his ordained priesthood. Yahushua chose to use priest after his order to carry out his work of forgiveness. The Malkitzedic priesthood of Yeshua, one in Moshiach. Yaakov, James 5.16, James clearly teaches us that we must confess our sins one to another. Not just privately to Yahuwah. Yaakov 5.16 must be read in the context of Yaakov 5.14, which is referring to the healing power, both physical and spiritual, of the Malkitzedics in community. So when Yaakov says, therefore, in verse 16 of chapter 5, he must be referring to the men he was writing about in verses 14 and 15. Am I crazy? A text out of context creates a pretext, and error begets error, and you trip all over yourself. These men are the Malkit Zedek priests of the community to whom we must confess our sins. Acts, Masa Shlechim, 19, verse 18. Many came to orally confess sins and divulge their sinful practices. Oral confession was and should be the practice of the priesthood. It was of the early Malkitzedic priesthood, just as it should be today, because that's all part of cleaning the inside of your cup. Matichahu 3 6 and Mark 1 5. Again, this shows people confessing their sins before others as a historical practice. Here with John the Baptist, are we really to believe that people confess their sins to John the Immerser and that he did then not offer them forgiveness? He just left them hanging? Are we are we really to believe that? Of course he gave them forgiveness. The only other option is they confessed their sins to him and he gave them no forgiveness. Right? 1 Timothy 6.12. This verse also refers to the historical practice of confessing both faith and sins in the presence of many witnesses. 1 John 1 verse 9. If we confess our sins, Yahweh is faithful to us and forgives us and cleanses us but we must confess our sins one to another. Numbers chapter 5, verse 7. This shows us the historical practice 
of publicly confessing sins, right out of the book of the law, right there, and making public restitution. I had somebody call me up and confess, finally, confess their sins this week through a voicemail. Praise Yahuwah for that. Now, to follow through with that, you would make public restitution. You see, it's easy to take the, you want to take the easy, the rough, but you don't want to take, you know, you want to take the smooth, but you don't want to take the rough. You've got to take the rough with the smooth. It's a two-part process here. Forgiveness of sins, not unto death. Yes, but you've got to follow up. Otherwise, it's just lip service, right? Amen. And we know that lip service, hmm, that doesn't count for too much, does it? Nehemiah, chapter 9, verse 2 and 3. The Israelites stood before the assembly and they confessed sins publicly and they interceded for one another. And I want to read to you from a text from the um, 387 of the Common Era, John Christotum. And he wrote this. Malkitzedek, priests, have received a power which God has given neither to angels nor archangels. Bear in mind, this is from 387 of the Common Era. It was said to them, whoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whoever you shall loose shall be loosed. Temporal rulers have indeed the power of binding, but they can only bind the body. Malkitzedic priests, in contrast, can bind with a bond which pertains to the soul itself and transcends the very heavens. Did God not give them all powers of heaven? Whose sins you shall forgive, he says, they are forgiven them. Whose sins you shall retain, they are retained. What greater power is there than this? The Father has given all judgment to the Son. And now I see the Son placing all His power in the hands of men. Matthew 10.40, John 20, verse 21. And we know the Catholicos corrupted this and you had to go into the little chamber, you know. And you can't look at what went wrong and not do what is right based upon that. You've got to get healing. You've got to get healing from your Catholic past. Jerome wrote this in 388 of the Common Era. If the serpent, the devil, let's try that again. If the, if the serpent, the devil, the devil, the devil, if the serpent, the devil, bites someone secretly, he infects that person with the venom of sin. And if the one who has been bitten keeps silent and does not do penance and does not want to confess his wound, then his brother and his master, who have the word of absolution that will cure him, cannot very well assist him, can they? It makes sense, does it not? I've been bitten. I've been bitten. Will you help me? Will you heal me? Will you dress my wound? I confess this. You see, that is the power. The power is through the mediation of his son that he places upon the people. And the synagogue of Satan is terrified of Yahuwah's people being empowered. And the message that's communicated from this ministry is a ministry of empowering people. Setting you free from the chains of men. You have your dictionaries. You have your scriptures. You can get into the paleo. You do not need to be in chains anymore. We're in this together. We reason together. We sharpen the sword of the word together. And he sets us free. But you know what? They're going to label you. Anti-Semitic, Nazi sympathizer, lawless. They're not going to understand the polemics of what you bring forth when you say the book of the law and the book of the covenant are not synonymous. 
One is covenant and faithfulness. The other is an imposed law because of the golden calf sin infraction. They want to toe the status line because they want to keep you in a religious construct. Yes, they broke free from the religious construct of institutionalized Christianity, but then they grabbed hold of the life buoy of messianic Judaism, which is built upon Satanism. It's built upon the blasphemy that Judaism is. Look at the history of where the Messianic movement came from. It came from Judaism and Jews wanting to out-Jew the Jews in the 1960s. But then guess what? Non-Jews, those in the nations, what they would call Gentiles, they're like, hey, yeah, we should be doing the feasts. Hey, yeah, we should be keeping Sabbath. Yeah, in fact, I want to clean up my diet. and Yeah, I want to keep kosher and... Yeah, the Bible doesn't change. That was our heart, right? So we continue in that righteous approach to Scripture. And look what he does. He leads us into all truth. Here's another commentary on Mark, um, excuse me, on Matthew 3.16 from 398 of the Common Era. We read in Leviticus about lepers where they are ordered to show themselves to the priests. And if they have leprosy, then they are to be declared unclean by the priest. Just as in the Old Testament, the priest makes the leper clean or unclean. So in the New Testament, the priesthood binds or looses, not those who are innocent or guilty, but by reason of their office, when they have heard various kinds of sins, they know who is to be bound and who is to be loosed. Sins unto death is a sin that leads to physical death of the sinner. Sins unto death, murder, kidnapping, adultery, and other perversities that are listed. Bar Midbar, Numbers 18.22, Deuteronomy 22.26, Yeshayahu, Isaiah 22.14, Jubilees 21.22, 26, 34, and 33, 13. I'm not saying return to the Catholicos. I'm saying we must push past that hurt that many of you have from the Catholic Church and embrace the anointing that he has put on you in the order of Melchizedek. You see, our audience has ramped it up in Yahusha to now viewing a spiritual death by the secessionists because of their denying of his messiahship. Those secessionists, they were going towards spiritual death. His role as son of Yahuwah in the flesh and their denying that he was real, them thinking that he was a phantom, they were going the way of spiritual death. Because they needed Yahusha and they needed to understand the reality of him to really receive atonement. But they were going to now find themselves in spiritual death. The sin unto death amounts to specific manifestations of unregenerate conduct for which blasphemy against the Ruach serves as an umbrella rubric. Simply put, it's any violation of the fundamental terms of a relationship with Yahuwah that Yahusha the Malkit Zedek has mediated. Think about that. Very sobering. Finishing up with the last three verses. This has been an amazing journey going through the epistles of 1 John for me. And we know that we are of Yahuwah and that the whole Olam Hazer lies in the wicked one. And we know that the son of Yahuwah has come and he has given us binah, wisdom, Understanding that we may know him that is emet. Him that is true. And that we are in him that is emet, truth. Even in his son, Yahusha Hamashiach. He is the Elohim emet and he is eternal Chaim. I'm going to repeat that for those of you. I hope, I don't think my audience has that. But there is an audience out there that's ears are not blood tipped. He, Yahusha, 
is the Elohim Emet. He is eternal Chaim. And some people, they want to just, just gag and choke on that. Pretty good at that, right? On that verse. But look at verse 20. It contains an overt description, an overt ascription of the divinity of Yahusha. It predicates full divinity to Yahusha. There's no grammatical reasons for denying that Yochanan here calls Yahusha the true Elohim. There's no ifs. There's no ands in no variant text that you can come up with. You can't back translate the Aramaic, the Greek into the Aramaic or whatever you do, back translating to find an Aramaic script that doesn't actually exist. I love that one, right? It's like, oh, I ha well, now what one is that from? Because there is no first century Aramaic. How did you get that one? Well, we back translated it. Oh, <laughs> okay. From the Greek. Oh, through the Hebrew to the Aramaic. Got it. Okay, back translation. There is no ifs and there is no ands. He's clearly defined as Elohim. You can communicate this to that. He's clearly defined as Elohim, the genuine one, divinity. And those refusing to accept this truth are labeled as idolaters. That's what they are. You don't, so the JWs, they're, they're into what? Idolatry. They're idolaters. Because they do not accept this truth. They are idolaters. Measure your Hebrew roots against that one. Okay? And see how deep they really go. Very sobering. Verse 21. But I, Israel, you've got to guard yourselves from idols. Amen. Amen. Today and then, the schismatics are guilty of idolatry by learning and then denying the truth. And the ones that we're up against, they're guilty of idolatry too. Because they learned the truth of the water, of the blood. And then they deny one and two. They deny number one, the Enchidati, the priestly transference performed by John the Immerser by water. And then they want to kick the son's feet off of his footstool and enthrone an earthly high priest in Jerusalem. Idolatry, idolaters. Mark them and move on. Amen. Study to show yourself approved. What a word of Yahweh that is powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. Yes, Yochanan addressed the secessionists 2,000 years ago. But today we use this text and it addresses the synagogue of Satan in our very midst. And we cast them out. And we move to those in the nations, many, many brethren, that have the heart in the Christian church. I want to keep his commandments. I want to keep the Sabbath. I want to keep the feasts. Yeah, I want to. I don't think we should be eating pork. I think we should be keeping the dietary requirements because wasn't that verse about him making those in the nations clean. That's why he went to Cornelius, right? He didn't have a pork sandwich there. He went to Cornelius, right? Context, right? Yes, yes, you're starting to see it. I want more. That's where we go, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. We don't go to those that are not our brother, that are steeped in demonic activity that's built upon Judaism, which is blasphemy. Questions, comments in the back, brothers? 
Um, before we get into the questions, I do just want to put a bracco, a blessing upon all of you as we now go to Sukkot here in Salem. A special bracco blessing upon those that are Sukkot in Georgia, those that are doing Sukkot with Torah to the tribes in North Carolina, and those of you Sukkot, Texas. So blessings to you all. We pray that you would have a rich time of fellowship as Torah to the tribe Sukkot are popping up over the nation. And we are just so blessed that we're able to communicate this message to you. <coughs> Brothers in the back. I um, have a comment first about just how awesome and timely this message is with the new world religion coming to, I mean, like, wow, wow. Um, but uh, two things, uh, two questions. One was, uh, you had mentioned that there's a time to stop praying for something, and I keep hearing, brother, if we'll just humble and pray, you know. For he, someone, he, for he, someone. Heal our land. For a person. There's a time to stop praying for people. When a person is given over to such transgression and sin, right, right. But you need to align. We need to align ourselves with Yahuwah. And at some point, we have to not align ourselves with the world because people have been given over. And that's what we see with Jeremiah. And there comes a time, and that takes discernment to know when that time is. But I see so many people banging their heads against the wall with people that are obstinate and not interested in repentance or the truth. At that time, you have to align yourself with Yahuwah and his judgment rather than aligning yourself with the transgressor. And, and my other question was, uh, you had mentioned uh, um, our duties as a priest. When someone says, hey, I've been bit, you know, can you, you know, pray for me? Wasn't leprosy itself a sin, or not a sin, but a sickness that would lead up to death? No, not necessarily. It wasn't a sin unto death. No, sickness? Not necessarily. No. no. I mean, yes, some people died, but it wasn't classified as a sin unto death. Question in the back right there. The, the blood in the water is a sign to the Jews after the Passover sacrifice was finished when they washed the the blood of the sacrifice that came out of the side of the temple is a witness. This also was witnessed by the, the Roman guard as the veil was rent and the um, priesthood was being changed. Amen. That's the witness. And that's the witness that the synagogue of S.A. Tan rejects. It's a twofold witness. Very good word. Uh, we have two questions from the internet audience. Uh, the first one is, is the Melchizedek priesthood taught the same as the one in the 18 of Freemasonry and Mormonism? Not at all. Not at all. First, and, and this is what you've got to be so careful of, because people are popping up, and then they're coming, and you, you think that they're, they're, they're getting the message, and you think that they're in alignment with the true gospel, and then they divert. The true message, we identified it in an earlier teaching. We can put the links in below on the YouTube after. But the biggest one is the true message is a book of the law, book of the covenant division. Mormon has never had that revelation. Never in the 18th, 19th. No, I mean, there are all kinds of perversions of Malkitzedek. You can type in Malkitzedek and you'll get some New Age mysticism. That's why you have got to stay on the orthodoxy of the message. And what we do is we get a couple of these talking heads and they grab a hold of it and they're like, oh, this is a popular message. I'm going to now start teaching it, but I don't agree with this. I don't agree with that. And then they unravel the whole thing and come up with something completely AWOL. And it's gone away from the orthodoxy of the message, which is distinctly about covenant definitions of the blood ratification of the Book of the Covenant at Exodus 19.4 through 24.11. And then the addition of the Book of the Law, which was the schoolmaster implemented, and it was given at the golden calf break, which now Yahushua comes along, 
dies, pays for the blood ratification of Genesis 15 and returns us to the covenant of Genesis 12. It's book of the covenant, Malkitzedic Torah of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, Galatians, Hebrews and all of the other texts that we've spent years delving into cannot be dismissed that easily. Brother, and then we get back to the other question online, right? Yes. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Um, and where do you hail from, oh holy brother? When I hail from, I can't do as good as accent. Oh, I, uh, Arizona. Arizona. My brother Mario invited me up here. Um, Wonderful. It's a pleasure to be here, meet so much Mishpacha. But Hallelujah. I just wanted to ask, when you look at like Leviticus and those book, the, the parts in the Bible that are of the book of the law. Correct. Should we still be looking at them, researching them, and seeing how they apply to us internally? Nobody able... ever said, get rid of the book of the law. I mean, okay. It is Yahweh's holy Kadosh word. And so we should have the full counsel. And we have the apply. full, we don't get rid of the prophets. Thank you. We don't get rid of anything from Genesis to Revelation, but we live in covenant. We yeah, understand yeah. that the book of the law was imposed, not agreed to. It had all of the Levitical precepts to a nation in rebellion and in broken covenant. Because their heart was not circumcised and they disregarded the covenant, Yahweh put more laws on them, and the laws that were in the book of the covenant, he had to explain it to them so much detail because they weren't getting it and their heart wasn't circumcised. So we can go into the book of the law all the time and find so many wonderful things, but don't try and make your Levitical opinion my burden. Amen. That's all we're saying. I, I really but if you don't understand the polemic between what we're speaking about, then you'll come to all kinds of false conclusions. And that's what happens. I mean, I pray that that will be sufficient for many who come against what I try to share when they're asking that. They're like, well, he's saying do away with part of that. I'm like, well, first of all, who do we take counsel from? Forget, and point is, is that, but look at what it is. It's what we are to drive and drosh from. We're supposed to take out the things that don't apply. We don't have a temple. We don't have a tabernacle. We don't have a little Levitical system, a sacrificial system, and we don't have all that. But what we do have is the temple of our tabernacles, living tabernacles, and how to apply what is kadosh and what is not kadosh, what is set apart and not. And I think that that just solidified it, and they can look back and be like, yeah. he does everything, do away with Everything it. of the Malkitetic covenant living is Genesis 1.1, to Exodus 24, 11. Any, everything in there. And you'll go in there and you'll read about witnessing, correct? Witnesses, covenant witnesses, all the way through the covenant. And then there's more information about two or three witnesses in the book of the law because they needed it so spelled out because they broke it. Amen. Yahweh was to convert our hearts so that we wouldn't go and commit adultery. But guess what? They did. They went a whoring. So guess what he did? He said to them, you need to put fringes on the four corners of your garment. Now, I don't have a problem with tzitzit. My question is this. I'd love to see an authentic scriptural tzitzit. Four corners of your garment? Look at it. They wore fringes around their neck, fringes around their arm, fringes around their arm, and fringes around their hem of their garment, which the woman grabbed hold of. Wear them. But you don't have to take a Jewish interpretation, which is totally non-scriptural, and strap them to your belt loops and then use that to judge people. There's nothing wrong with that. But don't make your opinion my burden. That's all we're saying. I'd love to see an authentic, non-Ashkenazi interpretation of that. Because they weren't wearing tassels like we see today. That is an invention of man. It's not scriptural. The what they were wearing, I just described for you. And we can put that one up. I have a picture of that both historically and um, descriptively. So it's very easy to not understand the polemic and then make these massive things. Why were they given seat seat? Because they, their heart was a whoring. 
that they literally needed something on their garment that before they did something immoral, they would be reminded. Now, if you need that because your heart isn't converted and that's going to help you not go a whoring after women or men, then, you know, that helps. Great. For me personally, because I've been converted and I'm in the covenant, I don't need that because the whole purpose of it wasn't for us to dress up. The whole purpose was so that we wouldn't go whoring after others that we weren't supposed to. And when they were in the covenant, they weren't given those commandments because they were in covenant fidelity. Are there many things to learn from the book of the law? Yes. Sabbath is mentioned in the book of the covenant, but there's a lot more information about it in the book of the law that I want to study. But I understand that what was added was the Levitical precepts, ordinances. And I know that that is now a Levitical opinion, which was added because of transgression, and that is not my burden. But I would never, ever teach anyone to do away with anything. It's all Yahweh's holy word. All of it. It's for righteousness. But you've got to discern what's covenant and what's not and do the Torah of Abraham. Because Abraham never saw any of that. And he was righteous before Yahuwah. Do the Torah of Abraham. Did Abraham teach Torah to his children? Where do you think in the book of the law where it says, teach the Torah to your children, where did that come from? It came from Abraham, who taught the Torah to Isaac, who taught the Torah to Jacob. So you can't rip a text out of context to create a straw man that you're going to blow over in front of people. That's ridiculous. They prop up the straw man, and then you blow your hot air, and over goes the straw man. Come on. It's disingenuous. Question. Yeah, I've, got, I've been posed with a question several times in the last few weeks of in some of the older texts like the Septuagint um, in the, the, the is, section... Is the mic on? Is it on? Oh, okay. Yeah, it's on. I'm just... <laughs> I thought I usually speak loud enough everybody can hear me. <laughs> but uh, the in the Septuagint where it says, and in the polyglot where it says that the book of the law was placed on the side of the ark as a witness, but the words against you are not I in those texts. Right. And my understanding has been that that word witness, be in the context of what Moshe is saying to them, is that because you did this, even while I'm still alive, how about when I'm gone, you're going to do this again and out of the mouth of two other witnesses. Well, what witnesses, do witnesses do? What is the very they, function and purpose of a witness? To testify is to witness for against, against yeah. or to witness to. So, I mean, that's the problem, is people will literally get on a word, one little word, like earth. <laughs> Right? And then it's just like, oh my goodness, talk about tunnel vision without seeing the whole scope of Scripture. And that's exactly what we, we've got in the institutionalized church, right? You get, they get focused on one little word and then build a whole doctrine about it, the Johannine comma, and you've got the Trinity, right? Focused on, well, look at this additional word. Come on. Yes, eat the mic. Scared of the mic. Praise Abba for your teaching. Um, as a called evangelist, I boldly and faithfully say that Abba is building me up to. Uh, with this teaching, I want to know your thoughts on what you think of 1 Corinthians 19 through um, 24. Mm. Let's have a look there. Where are we at? What verse? Oh, nine. Oh, First Second. Corinthians nine. First Corinthians nine. I was like, wow, nineteen. Man, somebody ripped some pages. Ah. Yeah. What happened? <laughs> I was nervous. That's all right. That's all right. What verse though? Nineteen through twenty. Oh, yeah. Oh, got it. First Corinthians nine nineteen. Got it. All right. Got it. Got it. For though I am free 
from all men. I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more to the Yahudim. I became as a Yahudi, that I might win the Yahudim. To those who are under the book of the law, as to under the book of the law, that I might win those who are under the book of the law. To those who are without the law, as without the law, not being without a law toward Elohim, but under law towards Moshiach, that I might win those who are without the law. To the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be a partaker of it with you. Now, this verse, these verses are often used by the institutionalized church to say that Shaul was a hypocrite, right? Well, he did this one to one thing, but he wasn't really doing that. He was doing that. But we understand that when Yahushua died and rose again, the whole thing that we've been teaching is the transference of the priesthood. And with that blood ratification of his death, the institution of the new covenant, which is a return to book of the covenant Torah. We're not lawless. We return to the Torah, the book of the covenant Torah. Genesis 1, 1 to 24, Exodus 24, 11. We see the covenant at Exodus 19, 4 to 24, 11. But we have to understand that Rab Sholiak Shaul lived at the point of the cusp transition. He lived at the point of the transitional cusp. So would he go into the synagogues where they were still adhering to the book of the law? And would he communicate to them where they were at the message of revelation? We see that he did that with the Galatians in Galucha. So what I believe this is talking about is that he was communicating to people where they were at. And, and I have found this myself that you have got to meet people and respect them where they're at so that you can then go in and open up the conversation. So you're not going to go in there all bold-faced book of the covenant to a book of the law synagogue, which was the traditional synagogue and the religious precepts that had been in place since the golden calf without meeting them where they're at. It's not hypocrisy, it's just that Paul was on the cusp, the transition part. And we can get, there's a lot more to those few passages and how you interpret that. But the other version is that people are saying that Paul was a hypocrite, and I certainly don't believe that. Question? Uh, the last thing the internet audience was asking, what is Baruch Hashem? Baruch Hashem means bless the name. So I would always add Baruch Hashem Yahuwah because what name are you talking about? Hashem, what's that? All right, Baruch Hashem is only part of the blessing. Baruch Hashem Yahuwah. But you can also say Baruch Hashem Yochanan, Baruch, Has Baruch Hashem Zephania back there, you know. Bless the name of Steve. Bless you, brother. That doesn't mean you're you're worshipping him. You just want to bless the brother, right? But ultimately, we know that when we're speaking Baruch Hashem, it's Baruch Hashem Yahweh because we're in the service of him. But we can pray blessings upon one another. Yeah. Uh, just one thing I wanted to add, and that was that for the internet audience, we will be posting the links for the Sukkot teachings as we can. Oh, okay. We will be. Fabulous, fabulous. It is Sukkot, and we have a Oneg and some noshing and schmoozing. Amen. Thank you, brothers in the back. John, anything? Huh? Huh? Oh, thank you so much. Yes, thanks, brothers. <laughs> Baruch Hashem, Yahweh. Abba, we thank you that we have this time in your word. We thank you that we were able to dig in to Yochanan Aleph, 1 John, and go through these epistles of 1 John, Abba. Prepare our hearts for your Moadim. And Abba, as we congregate together in these days, in these times, Abba, let us be as wise as serpents 
and as harmless as doves. We enjoy the fellowship, the prayers of the Kedoshim. I thank you for each and every one here tonight and on the internet audience in Yahusha's mighty name. Be blessed. Amen. Amen.